I'm James Holder. Welcome to Full Court Football 24. We're in the lab today with me. I've got former Premier League and Jamaican international, none of them, Mr. Jamie Lawrence. Great to meet you, Jamie. How are you? Good to meet you, James. I'm all right, mate. How are you? I'm very well. I'm very well. Top man. So you've had you've had quite an interesting career and quite an interesting life. I'm looking at some of the some of the facts and stats behind it and stuff and the journey. Could you could you take me right back to the to the start of your footballing sort of uh, journey? What from when I was a kid? Yeah. yeah. Well, um, I played like any other kid football when I was a youngster at school and whatever. Uh, obviously, my mom and dad never had much money, so the um, headmaster at our school is the first person who bought me a pair of football boots. So, um, obviously, it proves I was half decent. So, I then started playing for a team called Larkle Phoenix. That was on the Saturday. That's where I actually played against Kevin Campbell and played with Kevin Campbell. And we was quite decent, actually. Um, it's either us or their team called Ironside, what used to win near enough everything. We had a geezer called Pete Rose, who was one of the dads of one of the other kids, who was the manager of our team. And he's one of the, one of the people who instilled in me that winning mentality. If you lost there and that, always been forfeits from when I was a young kid. So it brings your mindset to like I ain't taking losing, and that's one thing what I've took all the way along. And then I went round a long way. I never went to no academies really. I had a couple of trials at Palace, Millwall, never got nothing. And then my mom and dad went back to Jamaica when I was seventeen. And I was left in England on my own with my sister. I never had much money. And then I fell into a life of crime, which um, I got three years, at, done a year out of it. That was at Feltham initially, the first Yeah, the first sentence. I, got, I went to Feltham, Brixton, and ended up doing a sentence in Dover. And then I got out after a year, got parole first time. Um, and then I got arrested after three months. Um, for a robbery you know, and ended up getting four years and my friend who I jumped in for went queen evidence against me. Yeah, I, I jumped in for him as well. So, as I say, you can't trust everybody, you know. Is that at this point in time where people are sort of counting you out of life? You look like you're on a downward spiral. Your yeah, second so second time in, in prison in, in sort of, in as many years, if you like. What What was your mindset at that stage of life? To be fair, when I, when I got the four years in that, I was thinking, you know what, my life's over. I think crime's going to be the way I'm going to go in. My dream's over as a footballer. And the judge has actually said to me, he's gone, listen, if you come in front of me again, I'm going to lose you in the system. And I was like, boy, I feel like I'm lost anyway, you know what I mean? I ain't got no one here. I've got four years. And then um, my saving grace, they sent me to Isle, Isle of Wight, Camp Hill. Where I never knew much about the camp, um, camp Hill either way, but I knew that it was a worse prison for my sentence because it's all violence and drugs when I got there. I, I just turned 21 as well, so I shit myself really. Uh, I don't care who you are, when you're going into prison, you don't know what to expect and you're shitting yourself, you know what I mean? So I walked in there and some geezer tried to bully me the first couple of weeks I was there. Put, put my name up for the phone and he's like rubbed it out in front of me so I'm like I'm going, what are you doing he's going listen shut up yes I do you I said you know what you better do me then All right. so we went to the table to this room had it out I knocked him out broke my hand on him then I lost a week but he got shipped out of prison and then after that it was, it was not too bad for me and then then I played for my wing in a um, wing competition. We won the um, whole competition. And then they said, oh, do you want to play for the prison side? So we played Boxing Day. I remember it was like it was yesterday. We played a semi-pro side called Cal Sports. And um, I scored two goals against them. And I never thought nothing more of it. I scored the winner in the 80-something minutes, scored a header. And then um, they went to the governor, asked the governor if... Um, I could play for him. But I still never thought it was going to happen and that. So look what they said, um, let him go on home leave. And if he comes back from his home leave, after he's done a year and four months, then we'll see. So I was still playing for the prison side. Teams used to come in and play us all the time. We was unbeaten all the time I was there and that. 
And then um, when I'm home, they come back and they started letting me out every weekend to play for Cal Sports at semi pro so. And this is really your first first side you've actually ever played for other than, yeah. than grassroots yeah. youth football? Yeah, my, the first side I've proper played for. Like, I played for Old St. John's and that, but I don't really care. But for semi pro level and that, that's the first side I've ever played. First fans I've ever played in front of. Because when I first went there, they were getting about two, three hundred fans every week. When I got there and I started playing, I was getting five, six, seven hundred fans every every. It's incredible. It's mad. It's mad. I was like a celebrity on the island, but it was a madness. Like, and then TVs, TV like GMTV coming to the prison to interview me. I had newspapers coming in, and I was like, I was then thinking, you know what? I've got a little chance. I've got a sniff. I might make it. And Cal Sports manager. He was an absolute diamond and a prison officer. Normally, a lot of prison officers are cunts. Let's have it right. But this one, he looked out for me. And he's one of them ones. He wanted people to do better. Right? How do you get that mentality of changing from prisoner to player? No doubt the first time you was trusted to go out. Was, it, was there a little bit of you in the back of your mind thinking, oh, I can slip off here or I could do this? Or? No, because I'm not, I knew, like, I've always wanted to play football. And... This is my dream, so I ain't going to fuck it up with anything. And without my prisoners in there, who looked out for me as well, mm. because you know you get some reserve fuckers and that, mm. all the prisoners what I had in there proper looked out for me and they always wished me the best. Because the way I acted, I never worked big time or whatever. I was one of the boys and they was, they was proper proud of me. Like A lot of my the prisoners I was in, I'm still mates with them today. And they're always telling me how proud they are of me. You know what I mean? So it was it was easy for me to slip into football and uh, football and prisoner, and it made it easier for cause the, my teammates I played with as well. The teammates I played with. Was there any prejudice from those guys at Cal Sport? You're coming in as a as a convict, if you like, from the local prison to play for their team. How did they How did they react to you? Mate, they were all positive. You know how mad it is. Like I went on the town visit, and they was giving me the the keys to their house so I can go and see my bird. I mean, I'm a convict and they're, they're giving me the keys to their house so that just proved how much they trusted me and loved me, you know what I mean? And that opened up my eyes in a big way as well because I come from South London and, you know, you're, just, you're normally just with your kind, you know what I mean? When you, when you open your eyes and look further afield and that, there's a big wild world out there. And you learn how to talk to all different different folk, you know what I mean? And that's that's what helped me big time. You hit scintillating form for Cal Sports. How did the conversation come about that the uh, the big clubs were coming to sniff around and have a little look at you? Well, um the manager at the time knew a lot of people like Southampton, Portsmouth, and I was in prison with remember Ambrose Mandy? You must know where Ambrose Mendy. I know Ambrose Mendy quite well, yeah. yeah. I was in prison with Ambrose, right? And obviously he saw that game where I played against Cal Sports. He said to me, he got released before me, way before me. He was on two years and then said, listen, I'm going to keep in contact. When you get out, I'm going to get you a trial. So I thought he actually forgot about me, but obviously he was watching the telly and seeing me on the TV or whatever. So when I got my parole, TV cameras come and followed me out of the prison. I had a phone call saying that you, you start at South End on trial um, the day after my release from Ambrose Mendy. That's incredible. So, so I went there, nothing happened for me there. Cause I thought I was fit because you're, you're pumping all this weight and all that. And I'm playing football all the time, but you're not as fit as a professional footballer. So I, I was there a month, I never got nothing under... Barry Fry, who was another lunatic as well. Nice guy, but absolute lunatic. Let's, before we go further on, let's just stop on the Barry Fry stuff. What do you mean by absolute lunatic? He's a mad, mad as a hatter, mate. Like, he was a proper nice guy. He was a white boy, wasn't he? You know, proper white boy. He's still in the game now, though, but he was a white boy. And I'm, you know, I'm always thankful that he even gave me a chance to come through the door. Anyone who let me come into their club, I was always grateful, no matter what, how it turned out. Yeah. And that's where I'm, I met a few good pals like Ricky Otto, Andy Anser. Um, I'm still mates with them today. Um, Chris Powell, 
it was just um, God bless him, just got sacked from Southend, and like people like Brett Angel and all that, and all them boys looked out for me, which I really appreciate that because it's hard place going into a changing room. It's a hard place to go to, especially when you come from prison, because right? normally when people take the piss out of you, I was looking to fight. <laughs> I mean, and they made you weren't quite used to that sort of level of banter. No, I weren't. I weren't used to that banter. I was definitely not used to that banter. I used to get my back up and I'd, I'd be growling and that. But then, them boys showed me the way to go. Yeah. So what happened then after that? Then how did the, the decision come about that you were gonna get the opportunity to go to Sunderland? How did that? Well, well, how did that manifest itself? Well, I went there, Southend. Never got nothing there. Then I went to Millwall under Mick McCarthy. I played one game and said, it's, it's, he's got something, but he's not fit enough. So I stayed there for a month, and then I played against Watford, and I played really well. Uh, but they offered me £250 a week, but they wanted me to stay in digs with the young boys, because obviously they never trusted me with my past. They didn't want you to have your own gaff or a hotel. Yeah, because they, they never trusted me. I would just come out of prison. I, I, I can understand that now, but at the time I was like, just come out of prison. I'm going into another prison, you know what I mean? So I was like, no, if you don't trust me, I don't really want to sign there. Turned out to be a good choice to be for like, me at Millwall, I don't think it would have worked. But right? <laughs> like then I went to, um, I went Wimbledon, the crazy gang. I nearly signed there 200 quid a week. But then um, I ended up going to Sunderland, which... It would have been a perfect fit for Wimbledon, surely. That's a bit of you, isn't it? Yeah, but for me now, thinking back at it, the best thing I could have ever done was go to Sunderland. Was that for taking yourself out of South London, out of the manor, out of that, that mentality that you was in? Yeah, because you know when you've had shit on the road, it doesn't go away so easy. So for me to go 300 miles away, out of sight, out of mind, you know what I mean? And then I became a man myself. I think, it, do I really need that life? There you, go. you know what I mean? And I, Started a hard look at me. I said, you know what, I've got the best life ever now playing football. Even though I weren't getting much money, it weren't about the money for me. It's not about the money. I love the game and I've always wanted to play it as a little boy and to get that opportunity, I wasn't going to mess it up. What was life like in Sunderland from a fo football point of view? How did you take to, the, to the, the style of football that they were implementing there? Well, remember Terry Butcher, England captain? Well, he was a manager when I went up there. And I went there on trial. And when I got there on the Sunday, I wanted to come home. I was really? Homesick. I was homesick. Uh, uh, the way they talk as well, I couldn't understand them. I was thinking, <laughs> I, mean, I couldn't understand what they were saying at first. And, that, and I was like, on, on the phone to my mates, no, I don't like it here. I need to come. And they had me in one of the best hotels ever. And that. I'd never been in a hotel before, except for Her Majesty's, you know what I mean? Right. So I was like, I want to come home. Then I trained on the Monday, trained Tuesday, trained for uh, Wednesday. Then we played Leeds on the Thursday. And you know when you played well. And I played against a guy called Kevin Sharp. And I, I, I tore him apart. And then I'm thinking, Friday, Terry Bull just called me in the office, sat me down. And he's gone, you, you excite me, son. I'm going to sign you. And I'm thinking, fuck it now. And you, until you start sign on the dotted line, you don't truly believe it. He said, listen, go back to London, get your stuff. We've got Leicester next week. I'll meet you at Leicester. And then you come back on your sign in a week. So I come back to London, got my stuff, went to Leicester, played against Leicester, played well, we drew nil-nil. And then I'm on the coach, travelling with the boys. I'm thinking, fuck it now, I made it now. Then on the Friday... It's turned out to be my mum's birthday. I signed, I signed my contract, my first pro contract. Not on big money, mm. but I've signed. And I'm thinking, like, I've been in prison like for three years of my life, the last three years, and now I'm signing a professional contract at a big club, Sunderland. I mean, Roker Park. And I signed on a Friday. I made my debut live on ITV on the, on the Sunday. I come on for 20 minutes. And against Middlesbrough? Against Middlesbrough. Yeah. And funny story as well, doing the warm-up, and they sung, um, they put Jailhouse Rock on the tannoy and that, you know? <laughs> 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 uh, 
I was just reading it, and then someone sent me a program the other day about the JLS Rock. So, like, we lost 4 1 in this game, and I'm thinking, you know, it's a bit hard this football. But then on the Tuesday at Roker Park, I made my full debut against Luton at home, yes. and we won 2 0. And that's when I'm thinking, this football can't get much better than this. You must be pinching yourself from literally, as you said, spending three years in the jail to now playing for, for a professional football club, living. Every man's dream, not just your own, but every every person's every man's dream. dream. And like, the press afterwards, like in the, I was in the Sun, the Star, jailbreak, and all that rubbish. You <laughs> know, I mean, coming up with the old cheap ones and all that. And I was thinking, this can't get much better. But then, football's got a funny way of kicking you in your teeth as well when you, you least expect it. Um, Terry Butcher got sacked after probably about a month, six weeks of me being there. And then some geezer called Mick Buxton, flat cap man from Barnsley, Sergeant Major, took over, who hated me. Hated me and Let's my just break that definition down. Yeah. Flat cap man <laughs> from Barnsley <laughs> who hated me. <laughs> oh, he was proper boring. Like, he was a reserve team manager when I went up there, and I knew he never liked me. But because Tony Butcher was there, like, who liked me, obviously he's a manager, so he's got to listen to him. But as soon as he took over, it was... Christmas time, I was injured one. At Christmas time, one of my family got ill in London. I can't play anyway. So I said to him, like, can I go back to London? One of my family members are ill. Yeah. I said, you've got one day to go. It's 300 miles away. I said to him, look, by the time I get there, I've got to come back. You've got one day off, he said. I said, all right. Family for me is everything. I took 10 days off. All right. A lot of business, you can do whatever you want, all right? So when I got back, you find me, two weeks' wages. Then I was staying in the hotel, what Terry Butcher was paying for everything. I came back, he said to me, you've got to pay for eight weeks, for all your dinners, everything. Obviously, now I'm owing them money. I'm <laughs> paying for nothing. So I'm thinking, I don't like this guitar. So in the end, it comes to a head. He sold me. Ian Atkins, who was Terry Butcher's number two, he had a job at Doncaster. They sold me to Doncaster for 20 grand. In itself, £20,000 me getting sold after being in jail for like three years. I was only at Sunderland ten mo um, seven months. And they sold me to Doncaster. And then it must have been a really occurring thing because he got sacked after two months as well. <laughs> like I was getting managers sacked. But then the best thing happened... A geezer called Sammy Chung took over. At Doncaster? At Doncaster. And um, I was on, obviously, season finish. I'm in London. He took over in the summer. And I've gone back up there. He never knew nothing about me whatsoever. And I don't think he was half thinking that I was any good at first. And then um, I went up, trained pre-season on winning all the races. And then I played in the game the next day. And then he called me in the office. Him and this some, some geezer who was a proper sergeant major, but like me, he knew how to get the best out of me. Called me in the office, he gone, what do you want to do with your career? I said, I just want to go to the top. He's gone to me, listen, you can go wherever you want to go with your career. You've got so much ability, you can go wherever you want to go. And for a manager to say that, it gives you the confidence. Mm -hmm. You don't get arrogant, it gives you the confidence to go out and want to play and express yourself. And every team meeting, it'd be like, get the ball to Jamie. And he'd be like that to me, take him on. They can't live with you. And that's how it went. We were second in the league when they sold me. Like 10 months later, I was, I was signed at Leicester in the Premiership. £300,000. So this Mick Buxton flat cap man never knew much about football. <laughs> <laughs> And that's how I used to rise to these people, like, I want to do better. Football's a game of opinions, isn't it? So you can't let one person's opinion stop what you're doing. Yeah, listen, the, what I went through in my lifetime, I was lucky to play football. Mm -hmm. right? And uh, no matter what he said, I was going to go and try and prove him wrong all day long. Mm -hmm. I, I used that as my inspiration, right? and I did prove him wrong. Because I ended up playing four years in the Premiership. I passed Sunderland on the way up. Uh, so I obviously proved them wrong.